Okay, so, so today's talk is going to be on America's new religion <clears throat> and the deification of the state. And um, cultural apolo apologists like myself have been tracking this. Um, I got saved in 1981. In 1987, I wrote a book, The Decay of a Nation, The Need for National Revival, uh, 2003. I wrote God, Government, and the Road to Tyranny. Um, and uh, C.S. Lewis was writing about this, this stuff in the 1940s, that if we reject God and his morality, things are going to get bad. We're going to lose freedom. Francis Schaeffer wrote about it in the 1970s. But when I say America's new religion and the deification of the state, I'm actually repeating myself there. Because the new religion is worship of the state. It's treating the state like God. What we traditionally would go to God for, or sometimes even just our families and our church, or just individual responsibility, now we're going uh, to, God, to uh, the state instead. So the state is replacing God. We're deifying the state and worshiping the state. Um, this is the Q QR code. I have no, no idea how it works other than you get your smartphone and get that and you get the notes. So, so for whoever that applies to, you can get the notes, I guess, online and stuff like that by just clicking on, on that. And uh, so hopefully that'll work out for you. Now, this is the most important slide here in my talk uh, on America's new religion. I'm spelling out basically the most important aspects of this new religion on this one slide. The rest of the lecture is gonna be unfolding what each of these different things mean. And uh, so first you have postmodern relativism, where the, the idea that uh, which there's no absolute truth, there's no things that are true for all people at all times and all places. Um, in fact, we, we even have a president right now who's been influenced by this. Um, when he stated that, you know, we believe in truth, not the facts. And so what this amounts to is your postmodern community has a story. You don't believe in absolute truth anymore. So you have a story, and you believe that that story becomes your truth because you want it to be true. And it doesn't matter how many facts there are that refute your story. We don't care about the facts. We've got our story and then through our Nietzschean will to power, we're going to force that story down everybody else's throat. So, um, uh, but with postmodernism, it's all relativistic. There is no absolute truth, so we're free to create our own truth. There is no absolute morality, no universal morality, so we're free to create our own morality. And, uh, you know, Isaiah 520, what are those who call evil good and good evil? All of a sudden, Christians are the bad guys now, okay? And, um, um, and so with postmodern relativism, there is no meaning. We create our own meaning. There isn't even objective history. There's no true objective history, according to the postmodernists. So they're free to create, recreate, revise history and make it say whatever they want to. And right now, since they want to topple the United States of America and merge us into a global state, They've revised history, so our founding fathers are all bad guys. And um, I think when you, deal, when you deal with slavery, I think it's something like seven out of the, the ten first places on the planet Earth to end modern slavery, seven of those places were in America, were either states or territories. Um, this is before 1800 even. And, um, and, of course, not all the states were on board with that. Hence, that led to uh, the, the Civil War. But, uh, I mean, how many people tell you John Quincy Adams, after he left the presidency to fight slavery, he went back into Congress, which was a big demotion from the presidency, and in 1844, he called for the northern states to secede from the Union. And then if the southern states want to join them, they'd have to become free states. And, um, well, that, that ended his political career. So he pretty much got, got close to be, being censored, but... He was trying anything 15 years later, it was the Civil War. But postmodern relativism and then neo-Marxism, a new form of Marxism 
and critical theory, which attacks all the foundations of um, Western civilization, uh, the, the, the pillars of our society, that which holds everything together, these guys want to tear it down. And, uh, and then Friedrich Nietzsche, the German uh, atheist, he believed that if there's no God, there's no truth, there's no morality, there's no meaning. All that's left is man's will to power. And we're seeing that unleashed right now. So, you know, you, you disagree with some of our politicians today. They're not going to debate you. They're not going to give you reasons why they think they're right and we're wrong. They're just going to go to whatever power they can and... Um, you know, try to dig up dirt on you, they're going to attack the person. It's like J.P. Moreland said in, uh, I think, the year 2001, when reason and truth are gone, all that's left is shouting. And that's what we're seeing in the political arena today. Uh, of course, there's the rejection of the biblical God. It's kind of like this, oh, you know, all religions lead. If there's a God, all religions lead to him. We're okay with God. God is cool, just not the Christian God. Just not the God of the Bible. And, uh, and then globalism. They were going to solve all our problems with a one world government. So through the United Nations, um, we want to uh, basically rebuild the Tower of Babel. We think that's a great idea. God didn't think too highly of that. By the way, God is all for mankind uniting, but it's got to be unity in truth and unity in Christ. God is opposed to mankind uniting while in opposition to him. When mankind unites and we're still opposed to God, we're just going to blow this planet up. And so the UN thinks they have all the answers, and Bill Gates has got all the answers, and George Soros, no, that, that's not the case. So globalism, this, this, this march towards global government, radical environmentalism, you know, with, uh, and I'm sure Chris knows more about this than I do. He's actually done scientific research that would confuse me. Um, but there's a big debate about how much of climate, how much is going on, and how much of it is actually man made. And if there's a country that should win an award for the progress we've made in our treatment of the environment, it should be America. It's India and China that, you know, with all this. Uh, uh, all these in, environmentalist treaties that we sign, we always give them a pass. And um, so whatever the case, uh, it goes, you know, what, you, what they do too is the leaders of this movement, it's all about power and control, but they know that if they're going to get people to be their pawns and their servants, you know, encourage them to worship the earth, be a neo-pagan, stuff like that. But the guys who are calling the shots, no, they just want the power. They just, their God is power. And uh, so radical environmentalism, and all of this is leading to the deification of the state, treating the state, the government, as if it's God. We're going to see that even the definition of what the state is has changed. The state used to be, you know, in, in a country like, like ours where we elect our officials, it's our elected officials. Well, now it goes way beyond that. I'd, I'd actually argue that Google and Facebook and there are multi-billion dollar corporate Bill Gates that, that, that basically they've got the government in their back pocket. And, um, and so um, George or Orwell predicted that in the 1940s, that um, eventually the state would be the media plus the state plus billionaires um, plus the, the technology gurus, and that's exactly... Uh, what we're seeing. So all of this put together is America's new religion. And, um, you know, sure. What's that? I touch a, just a very little on uh, Klaus Schwab. Yes, the... Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, you know, and I do recommend, look, look up the World Economic Forum online. Um, they took down part of their website, but one of the things that Klaus Schwab put up on the website about the World Economic Forum is you will own nothing, you'll own no property, 
and you will be happy, something along those lines. And that got taken down from the site because a lot of people obviously weren't very happy about that. Uh, but that's, uh, that's, that's the global reset. We'll be talking a little bit about that, but that is a, that is a large piece of this, uh, this new global religious pie. Okay, so we want to look at postmodernist relativism and Friedrich Nietzsche's will to power. I'm going to start with Nietzsche and his will to power. There's a picture of Friedrich Nietzsche. And uh, Nietzsche, a lot of people, if you, want, if you get a chance, look up online his The Madman Parable. If you look up The Madman Parable, it gives a, he gives a little story, and it really sums up kind of the, the, the basic thrust of his thinking. And um, where he has a guy that comes too early, he's got a lantern, but the sun has already come up. So he, he's come too early. It's not the night yet. And the madman runs through the village and says, God is dead, God is dead. And, it, and the guys that are around there don't believe in God, so they're laughing at him. And so Nietzsche, primarily, his message was the fellow atheist. Because his, fel his fellow atheists were saying, look, we've, we've destroyed through Darwinian evolution and, and enlightenment rationalism, we've destroyed any reason for us to believe in God. We destroyed the, the Christian, the myth of, of Christianity, and so now let's celebrate. Well, Nietzsche, and, and it's, it's business as usual, Nietzsche said, look, I'm glad we killed God. I'm glad we killed that myth. And we've made belief in God obsolete among the movers and shakers of Western civilization. However, I'm terrified. I'm not partying. I'm terrified. Because now we've removed the foundation. Western civilization, our view of what is true, what is good, uh, meaning in life, the value of human life, all of that comes from... Uh, the Christian worldview. So when he said God is dead, what he's saying is the Christian worldview is no longer the dominant worldview of the leaders of Western civilization. So if God is dead, Nietzsche told his atheist colleagues, if God is dead, it's not business as usual. If God is dead, truth is dead, morality is dead, meaning is dead, now, Nietzsche thought after a, a very bloody 20th century, he died in 1900, after a, a very bloody 20th century, which really did come about, you know, big government killed between 170 million and 320 million of their own people, uh, just from 1917 to 1991 alone. That's the research of Dr. R.J. Rummel, University of Hawaii. And, um, but he said after the growing pains in the 20th century, this will bring about the overman or the superman, the next stage in the evolution uh, of mankind. That's what Nietzsche thought. Um, uh, but he said, though, you know, if, if God, truth, morality, and meaning are dead, then we've got to have a group of supermen with the courage to create their own new truth, new morality, and new meaning uh, through their will to power. And so it's got nothing to do with, you, you have politicians who could care less about what is true and what is right, and leaders who could care less about what is true and what is right. All they care about is power. So they'll claim they believe the dumbest things and push them off on people. Like, like there's more than two genders, male and female. I think a lot of the po political leaders that are pushing this stuff on us don't really believe that. But they want power, and they find, well, if I push that narrative, I get more power, and I'm in it for the power. I'm not in it to stand up for what is true or what is right. I don't even believe in truth or morality anymore. C.S. Lewis, um, 1940s, he wrote his book, The Abolition of Man, where as a Christian, he understood if Western civilization kicks God off the bridge, and then God's then we, we, we're going to throw out God's truth, God's morality. Eventually, that's going to lead to the abolition of man. In other words, if God is dead, man is dead too. 
the whole value for human life comes from uh, the fact that we were created in God's image. He wrote that in the 1940s because there was a, um, an elementary school textbook, English textbook, that was teaching moral relativism. C.S. Lewis said, if we teach this to our kids, this is going to abolish mankind. The few are going to control the billions and are going to treat humans as if we're subhumans. And it's going to produce a race of men without chest, men without moral consciences, okay? He even referred to the leaders as the uh, man molders of the New Age. This is long before the New Age movement. But C.S. Lewis saw this coming down. Um, Francis Schaeffer, he referred to it as the death of man in his book, Back to Freedom and Human Dignity, where he responded to the, to the behavioral psycho psychological views of B.F. Skinner. B.F. Skinner believed that there's no God, man is just matter, man is just his body, we don't have a non-material soul, and um, so if the elite, and there's no such thing as right and wrong, so if B.F. Skinner and his buddies, the atheist elites, if they can just control man, manipulate man genetically, I'm telling you, they want to get into our genes, okay? Control us genetically and then control our environment, then they can bring about the best possible world. Well, Schaefer in his book, Back to Freedom and Human Dignity, because uh, Skinner's book was Beyond Freedom and Human Dignity. Schaefer responded in a short book, back to freedom and human dignity. And he said, well, wait a minute, if there's no such thing as right and wrong, then there's no such thing as a better world in the future. So what is Skinner even talking about? And if human beings don't have souls, and there's no God, and we're just controlled by our genes and our environment, then that also applies to B.F. Skinner and his atheist buddies. I mean, we're assuming they're humans too. So, um, so Francis Schaeffer pointed that out in the 1970s. It's, it's kind of sad, but Schaeffer called it the death of man. Lewis called it the abolition of man. I wish we had, God gave them somewhat of a prophetic voice for Western civilization, and I, I really wish we had listened to their voices. And so, you know, in 1987, I wrote Decay of a Nation, The Need for National Revival, 2003, I wrote God, Government, The Road to Tyranny. And, um, and it, I have to admit, when I presented a paper on the coming death of Western civilization at the Evangelical Theological Society in 1998, some Christians, I gave it right there in Oregon and Multnomah, you know, and, so, and, and they're right there in Portland with the uh, Antifa, the Black Lives Matter, the rioting that, that you... When you turn on your television set and you watch the news, you're no longer, or get on the internet, you're no longer watching the coming death of Western civilization. You are watching the death of Western civilization. Okay? We are dying as a civilization um, right now. But I caught a lot of flack from other, other Christian, um, um, you know, uh, thinkers, and, um, and uh, over the last couple of years now, I've been getting a lot of phone calls, emails, and uh, some of them contact me on Facebook messaging and stuff like that, apologizing to me. And some of them I knew that they were saying, yeah, Francis is a good, solid apologist, but he's a kook when he talks about these cultural issues and the coming death of Western civilization. Now they're apologizing to me. Some of the scholars that have been apologizing to me I didn't even know they were bad-mouthing me behind my back. And uh, so, um, so it, it's, it's kind of good that a lot of Christian pastors and professors and thinkers are waking up and smelling the coffee now. It would have been nice if our Christian leaders were waking up and smelling the coffee in the 1950s, you know. And um, I wasn't even around then. I was born the first day of night. I tell people I was born the first day of 1960. And then the whole country went down the tubes. Um, but uh, so you have Nietzsche's will to power. Forget about truth. Forget about morality. Forget about meaning. We need to just, through our will to power, create our own truth, what our community wants to be true. Um, create our own morality. Uh, create our own meaning 
And, and so that's what we're doing is the state, we're replacing God with people who claim to speak for everybody else. That's like what it, it, the communist China is, the People's Republic of China. Like, like, like they're, they're really speaking on behalf of the people. Like Hitler in Nazi Germany was really speaking for the people and not himself. And Stalin in, um, in the old Soviet Union. Uh, so postmodernism, I'm just going to run through these slides real quick, but it rejects the idea of absolute truth. Instead, in fact, it even rejects the idea of an individual. As far as they're concerned, you know, modernism started with the rational individual. We don't need God anymore, the modernist thought. So you got the rational individual finding all truth and solving all our problems through human reason alone. Well, that failed so miserably, the last stage of modernism was existentialism. We still have the individual, but the reason is gone. Okay, the morality is gone. So all you got is the individual and his or her will, and they just have to self-actualize themselves through an act of the will, create meaning for their lives, because there really is no meaning. Create truth for themselves, because there really is no truth. Well, with postmodernism, even the individual is dead. So an individual has no value apart from their community, and when truth is gone, communities only have narratives. They just have stories. And they don't believe that their story, their narrative, their community's narrative is true. Like if it's the gay community or the radical women's lib community, they don't really believe that their narrative is true, but this is what they want to be true. And since they don't believe there's any real, true, objective history, we're going to force our narrative down everybody else's throat through our Nietzschean will to power. Uh, so they reject human reason's ability to find truth, and they say that truth uh, is relative to one's community. So, and the, so the individual only has value as being part of a community. Now here, here's a story right, right outside of University of Washington when the uh, Antifa, they, they call themselves anti-fascist, but in reality, they're much, much closer to fat being a fascist than all the people that they don't like. They're just different forms of socialism. There, there's, there's international socialists who want a one-world government, and then there's national socialists who might want a one-world government, but they want their nation to lead the way. And um, so Antifa would be opposed to the national socialism of Hitler or the fascism of Mussolini out of Italy but they'd be all for, um, you know, Marxist communism and the global international socialism that you would find in, in uh, communist China and, uh, and the old Soviet Union. That's why you're seeing a lot of our uh, political leaders siding with China every time China disagreed with former President Trump. When, when former President Trump wanted to stand up for United States sovereignty, that's, that's not on their list of priorities there. In fact, they want to get rid of United States sovereignty. But these little Antifa people, now Antifa's recruiting some pretty big, strong guys, but in the old days, they used to be all little people with their, their black masks on long before COVID and all, and they were, they were doing a protest outside of UW, and they got a couple blocks out there into the city, and these three young Caucasian males were walking by wearing ball caps, T-shirts, blue jeans, and probably sneakers. And they were, they were pretty big guys. They were like 6'2", 220, 230. They didn't look like they lifted weights, but if I was looking to pick a fight with somebody, I'd go somewhere else, you know? And, but they were just walking down the street minding their own business Well, the Antifa people walked up and pepper sprayed them in the face. You know, they were wearing their masks, the little Antifa people. So one of them just reacted from getting pepper sprayed. He threw a left hook and knocked this little Antifa person down. And the other Antifa people got all upset, and they got up in his face and said, why did you do that? Why did you do that? They couldn't understand why he did it. And he responded by saying, because you pepper sprayed me in the face. Now, something way bigger is going on there 
than just an argument between three guys wearing ball caps and, and, and three Antifa members. What you have is a clash of worldviews. I don't know if those three guys are Christians or not, but they were brought up in America that was based on Christian morality, so each individual life has value, and you have individual rights. The Antifa people are saying, no, people don't have individual rights. You're going to be judged by the community in which you're in, and we believe that the uh, European Americans... White Europeans, they would call it white. I'm, I, I don't know when I became a white guy, to be honest with you. I wasn't in the 1960s. I'm half Portuguese, half Italian, grandson of Portuguese and Italian immigrants. But somewhere, I think in the 19, late 1980s, early 1990s, they just decided to classify all European Americans as Caucasians, as whites. But whatever the case, in their view, the white man is the oppressor, and Antifa's here to, to save the day, and they're the oppressed. And so they think when they pepper spray these, these guys in the face, the guys should have either said thank you or should have just kept on walking thinking, hey, I had it coming to me because I'm part of an oppressor community and I'm automatically a bad guy because of the community in which I find myself. These guys, on the other hand, still had enough of the old Christian worldview where it's like, look, I got my rights. I'm a human being. You can't, little person, you can't pepper spray me in the face. You do that, I'm going to defend myself. But the, 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 the craziest thing of all was that neither side could understand the other side. Two totally different worldviews. And one was like, I'm dealing with the facts. You pepper sprayed me, I felt threatened, I knock, you, I knock you down. The other side was, we don't care about the facts, we've got our narrative, and in our narrative, we don't even know you, but you're automatically bad guys. And, um, and so, truth is relative to one's community, the individual is defined only by uh, their community. So if you're considered in an oppressor class, and this, by the way, is also neo-Marxism, we're going to see that, um, you're automatically a bad guy or a bad gal, no matter what you think, no matter what you've done, no matter what you've said, doesn't matter. You could be the nicest person on the planet Earth. If you fall into the category of an oppressive community, you're, you're automatically an oppressor. Um, there's a heavy emphasis in postmodernism on tolerance, but it's, it's kind of like this. All beliefs are equally true, and all behaviors equally wholesome. Oh, by the way, if you disagree with us, we can't tolerate you. So they call it tolerance, but in the end, they can only tolerate people who agree with them. Traditionally, we call that intolerance. Okay? Um, they reduce all authority to power. Traditionally, we viewed authority as something that you have to earn. Chris has done his homework. I've done my homework. So we've earned the right to be heard. You could disagree with us. You say, I think you guys are out to lunch, okay? But at least we've earned the right to be heard, okay? So authority was something you had to earn, you had to work for. And someone would say, yeah, I trust that authority because that guy or that gal has done their homework and, and they can be trusted. Um, well, they say that there is no right and wrong, there is no truth and falsehood, so authority is just nothing but raw power. So it's just a game. People are entering into politics today, some of them, many of them, maybe most of them, just to get power for themselves. Okay? Now, let me, let me say this. There's no reason for human government unless you acknowledge the biblical doctrines of creation and the fall. Okay? Creation says we were created in God's image, so human life is worth protecting. But if there was no fall, human life would not need protecting. Okay? So the biblical doctrines of creation and the fall uh, were worth protecting, we need protecting, but guess what? All the leaders of human government are fallen humans. 
So we need to figure out ways to limit their power. In our country, we've had checks and balances, separation of powers. Um, this new religion wants all that gone. It's all about power. And um, um, so instead of rational arguments, you get nothing but power narratives. They think that we create our own reality through language. That's why they use words as weapons, okay? And words that traditionally have meant one thing now sometimes mean the exact opposite thing. Okay, like, like racist used to mean uh, a person who hated people who weren't like them and then wanted to mistreat those people. That's traditionally what a racist is. Now you're a racist if you just fall into a certain community, a certain category. If you were born a certain way, yeah, okay, you're a racist and you're not a racist. And it's got nothing to do with a person's uh, behavior. So we create our own reality through language. We deconstruct text. Uh, that means that the reader has as much right to the meaning of the text as the author. Now, just think what that does to the Bible, okay? By the way, these guys are easy to refute. Jacques Derrida, one of the leading postmodern philosophers, wrote a paper arguing that the reader has as much right to the meaning of the text as the author. So a guy wrote a paper refuting him and totally misrepresented what Jacques Derrida said. So Jacques Derrida responded and said, no, you misunderstood me. That's not what I meant. And then the guy responded and said, I have as much right to the meaning of your text as you, the author, do. And I don't think Jacques Derrida responded uh, to that. And then, of course, there's, there's political correctness. It's all intertwined with this. You just, you know, you bring something up, and it just like, um, you bring, you say, well, I think abortion is killing unborn babies. Nope. Uh, abortion is the, is the woman's right. And they act like the debate's all over. There's no more thinking to be done. We've got the politically correct mantra. Uh, the debate uh, is over. So we don't have a whole lot of time to refute so, uh, postmodernism. I'll just throw a couple things out. But to say there is no absolute truth, that's self-refuting. Because the statement there is no absolute truth, if that's true, then it has to be false because that would be an absolute truth. Okay? So that, then they might say, well, you know what? Okay, maybe there is absolute truth, but man can't know it. Well, if man can't know truth, how could you know the truth that man can't know truth? So that's self-refuting. So right off the bat, there is absolute truth and man can know it. Okay? And then you need to move on to deeper truths like there is a God and you're not him. Okay? Um, uh, but they reject moral absolutes while creating their own new moral absolutes. Um, if... If language doesn't touch reality, then even their language doesn't touch reality. Um, and then they slam narratives. They say there is no meta narrative. Well, they treat postmodernism like it's a meta narrative, a story above all other stories to determine if other stories are, are true or not. While proclaiming tolerance, the postmodernists cannot tolerate any non postmodernist. Okay? It's really, they say there's no such thing as right and wrong. But you Christians are wrong to want your morality taught in the public schools. No, no, hold on. If there's no such thing as right and wrong, Christians are never wrong. Just leave us alone. But they're not consistent with that. They treat their, uh, what they want to be uh, moral, right and wrong, they treat that as absolute morality while de denying the existence of absolute morality. Now let's move on to neo-Marxist critical theory. To say the new, talk about the newer form of Marxism, got to talk a little bit about the original form of Marxism. Uh, Karl Marx, he and Friedrich, Engel, uh, Friedrich Engels wrote the uh, Communist Manifesto. And um, I don't want to get into all the, the big terms, but he just, he viewed economics determined, determines what happens, okay? And... Um, he believed that class struggle was going on and the workers need to revolt against the business owners. So he wanted the abolition of private property. You know, I've, I've had people tell me, well, I, 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 like, I'm a, I consider myself a communist. 
I say, well, why are you communist? Well, because I sum up communism in one word, sharing. And it, I, this was a police officer that told me this once when I was in a police department. I said, well, that's nice. Karl Marx summed it up in one phrase, the abolition of private ownership. The abolition of private property. That's a lot different than sharing. Okay? If you see four or five kids sharing what they have with each other, that's just sharing. Communism, somebody takes all their stuff and decides to redistribute it. And guess what? Whoever does the redistributing gets most of the stuff. Okay? And um, uh, Karl Marx wanted the abolition of the family, the abolition of religion. Uh, Black Lives Matter, this was stated right on their website, the same goals as Karl Marx. Their leaders acknowledge um, that they're neo-Marxist, and they've actually received training in, in, in Marxism. Uh, Marx wanted free government education for all children. Um, by the way, our founding fathers didn't call for that. That was up to the local communities and the families to decide, and probably if a Christian community wants to educate their kids, the Bible's going to be part of the curriculum. If uh, a Buddhist community wants to educate their kids, probably Buddhism is going to be taught, okay? But the people are free. The parents are free. Now when parents speak up at government-run school uh, board meetings, you got the uh, at attorney generals uh, talking about them like they're potential terrorists, domestic terrorists, because they think they have some say in the raising of their children. Excuse me, the children are on loan to the parents from God, not to the state. But when the state thinks it's God, uh, the parents don't have a say. Um, um, then they want progressive and graduated income tax to redistribute the wealth. They want a national bank. By the way, the 45 goals of the Communist Party in America to take over America... This was, comes out of the 1950s. W. Cleon Skousen, former FBI agent, uh, wrote this, uh, this book, The Naked Communist. I, I quoted from it in my 1987 book and then a little bit in the 2003 book. Um, but the 45 goals, one of the goals was to take over one or both of the major political parties in America. When you read the 45 goals, it reads like the Democratic National Platform. Okay? Now, I will say this, there's establishment Republicans that would agree with most of those two. And then that's why when you get a guy who's not bought, as obnoxious as former President Donald Trump was, he wasn't owned by the Republican establishment. And so the Republican establishment was saying, vote for Hillary, vote for Biden. And um, um, believe me, there, there's an agenda there. And... Uh, but we, we see all of this coming down in America, these Marxist goals. But where neo-Marxism comes in, it's, it's also called cultural Marxism. A guy's an Italian guy like Antonio Gramsci. I'm half Italian, so you can see where I got my good looks from. And, um, but Antonio Gramsci, these Marxists realized that there was a problem. Because before World War I, Marxists believed and Karl Marx taught that if war started in Europe, everybody knew war was going to break out in Europe. If war starts in Europe, the working class is going to revolt against the business owners. They're going to say, forget about this dumb war. Let's start the revolution. With all the chaos, let's revolt against our business owners. Instead, the working class went to war for their countries. They didn't revolt. That was the death blow of traditional uh, Marxism. It, Marx's main prediction came out false, okay? So after World War I, Marxists tried to figure out why the working class did not revolt. Antonio Gramsci, a Marxist out of uh, Italy, and then George uh, Lukacs, uh, believed that Western democracy and capitalism would have to be destroyed first, and then you could have the revolution. In other words... The workers need to revolt because they have it so bad. However, they have it so good in the West that we need to make the situation really bad for the workers, and then maybe they'll revolt. By the way, that's a lot of what's going on right now. 
Our politicians are spending trillions of dollars to make your comfortable lifestyle and my comfortable lifestyle very, very uncomfortable. We're not going to have any problem merging with Canada and Mexico to form the North American Union when we become as impoverished as Mexico is. Okay? And so that's what's going on right now. We have people in positions of power in, in our country that are neo-Marxists. They want to bring down American sovereignty, merge us into a global state, and then they're going to, they're going to try to get a piece of the global pie. Okay? And... Um, So, so Gramsci believed religion was too strong in the West. He said, he said, Karl Marx, you're right. Religion is the drug, the opium of the people. Uh, but it's good opium. It really keeps the workers from revolting. They think, well, I'll just be a good little worker. My bosses will treat me like trash. But in the end, I'll go to heaven. So I'm not going to revolt. So that's what Gramsci thought. So what he, he thought was that Western civilization had to be transformed Rather than accomplishing Marx's goals through revolution, do it through gradual change, through evolution. Infiltrate religion, the media, education, and politics. By the way, um, you read W. Cleon Skousen's book and the uh, Whitaker Chambers, his testimony before, it's on the congressional record. Um, Bella Dodd, um, I think Paul Kruger writes about her. I think that's his name. Um, um, but basically, we have people who came out of communism and embraced Christianity who then spilled the beans about how the communists infiltrated um, Protestant churches and Catholic churches, and they infiltrated the media, and they infiltrated the government. Okay, I'm, I'm telling you, this might sound weird, Joe McCarthy, we may have lost America when when the public turned on Joe McCarthy, Senator Joe McCarthy. There were real communists in the United States government trying to overthrow the United States Constitution. Once we said it's okay to be a communist and still take an oath to defend the Constitution and hold a high-ranking position in the American government, only a foolish nation would do that, okay? That's like going into a business venture with a guy that you know is going to steal your money, okay? And um, um, so the transforming um, of the civilization. Uh, Gramsci was an Italian Marxist. He was imprisoned by Mussolini, and he died in prison in 1937. By the way, the Marxist, the Marxist hating... The Marxists and other socialists hating the fascists and hating the national socialists, the Nazis, they're all so, they're just different kinds of socialism. It's all big government that controls everything. It's just you got, you got bad players all fighting for the same piece of meat. So the reason why the Marxists didn't like the Nazis was not because they had terribly different views. They were just fighting for the same prize, which is basically total control um, of the world. Um, and so here's George uh, Lukacs. Um, he tried to attack the family unit and Christian morality. He promoted sexual immorality to destroy society in Hungary. He referred to this as cultural terrorism. So he knew, he was like, look, if I can destroy the family through indoctrinating kids in, in the schools, in sexual immorality, Hungary will collapse and we can have a Marxist takeover, okay? And um, we're doing that in America today. And we don't call it cultural terrorism. We call it social justice, okay? Again, the power of words, weaponizing words. So he encouraged pre presenting sexually explicit material to children in education. His views were rejected and he had to flee from Hungary. Good for Hungary. In 1923, Lukacs went to Frankfurt, Germany to meet with other cultural Marxists, and they started what is called the Frankfurt School. And that's where you get the, the cultural Marxism, uh, the neo-Marxism, this newer type of Marxism. Uh, you know, the older form of Marxism, you know, whoever signs your check, 
when you go to work, that's the enemy. It, it's the oppressors, the business owners versus the workers, the oppressed. That doesn't work. So now they need more, they need to put more people in the oppressor group and more groups in, uh, in the, the group, the community called the oppressed. So they started the Frankfurt School in Germany. Uh, 1930, Mac, Max Horkheimer combined the psychological thought of Sigmund Freud with Marxism. So now it's not just workers, it's not just economic oppression, now everybody, not just the workers, we're now being psychologically oppressed by Western leaders. See, you know, none of this really makes any sense, but if you repeat a lie enough, people start believing it, and if you tell people that you love them, elect me, I love you, but you really want to smash them and enslave them, um, none of it really seems to make sense until you get down to the fact they hate the God of the Bible. And since Western civilization was greatly influenced by the God of the Bible, they've got to bring it down, and they want a global state built upon anti-Christian principles, and uh, their will to power comes into play as well. So now when the Nazis took control in Germany in 1933, the Marxists fled to New York City for two reasons. Number one, they were Marxists, they were international socialists, so they butt heads with the Nazis who were national socialists, okay? But they were all fighting for the same piece of meat, for the same power. But also, uh, many of the, um, uh, the cultural Marxists of the Frankfurt School happened to be Jewish. And if you were Jewish in Nazi Germany, you know, it's time to, it's time to flee. If you can get out, uh, it was time to get out. So then uh, they fled to New York City, and the Frankfurt School took up residence in Columbia University, which has had probably a greater influence than any, any other school on the education of our future educators. They developed critical theory. Uh, this view criticized every pillar of Western society. Uh, it attacked the family, what they would call democracy. We're not really a democracy, we're a constitutional republic, but basically the family, our view of freedom. They attacked Christianity, freedom of speech. That's why it, what cancel culture is all about. Okay? Um, traditional morality, capitalism, free enterprise. They attacked all of that. They want, they want to control the economy. They don't want a free economy. Uh, Theodore Adorno authored a book called The Authoritarian Personality, where he condemned traditional American views about gender roles and American views of human sexuality as prejudice. He labeled these views fascist. Again, weaponizing words, if I can call everybody who disagrees with me a fascist or a racist, then it makes it easier for me to win the debate. We got to get thicker skin. We, we want, we, as Christians, we want to defend the truth, but the first time we get called a bad word, we usually apologize, back down, and go away. Well, if we keep doing that, we're toast, okay? And, um, um, but he labeled, the, you know, American view of gender roles, male and female, that's fascist. Uh, American views of human sexuality, that, you know, marriage, one man, one woman, one lifetime, that's God's, God's ideal, okay? Um, no, these views are fascist. Uh, cultural Marxism shifted away from economic oppression, what Marx taught, to psychological oppression. And America was divided into two groups, um, the oppressors and the oppressed. The, the worst oppressors are male of European descent. Okay? And by the way, don't, don't allow them to divide us. It's a divide and conquer strategy. They want us all to hate each other, okay? Get into different groups, and this group attack that group, and that group attack this group. In the meantime, they do an end run around us and enslave us all. Uh, 
They say that the gender and social roles of men and women were defined by the oppressors. Um, so uh, gender distinctions don't really exist. They are simply a social construct. That's why we read articles, man gives birth to a baby. And now, now what do they, what do they, they refer to? Uh, I, can't, I can't remember, birthers or something. But, but they're, they're, they're basically, they're, they're trying to actually get us to believe that men can have babies. And in their warped view, men have had babies. Except these men were born as, and created as, as females. And then they pretended to be males and eventually had a baby. And so they're telling us that men can have babies. If you don't remember anything else tonight, men cannot have babies. Okay? And uh, in the beginning, God created them what? Male and female. So we don't have to study the other 75 genders and become experts on that. There's only two. Jordan Peterson is not even a Christian. A Jungian psychologist, psychology professor at University of Toronto, became world famous because he made the bold statement by saying, no, there's only two genders, male and female. And, uh, and he said, by the way, if Ralph wants me to call him Sally, I don't care. I'll call him Sally. But when the government tells me I have to call him Sally, now you're infringing on my freedom of speech. And that's where I draw my line in the sand. And it's like, you know, it used to be 20 years ago, you can get in trouble. You can anger people by sharing the gospel, talking about Jesus in public. Now you can get in trouble if you just tell the truth in public. If you just speak the truth, if you say, hey, excuse me, sir, uh, sir, hold on. You're walking into a lady's room. The men's room's over there. Who's the guy that gets in trouble there? Right? So, um, so it, it, we have become so godless, you can't even stand up for what is right and what is true. Because those who hate God hate truth. And they hate uh, that which is, is good. This guy's really big uh, in the Frankfurt School, Herbert Marcuse. He wrote Eros, you know, sensual, sexual love. Eros and civilization in 1955. Uh, he promoted sexual freedom outside of Christian morality. So he promoted sexuality outside the bonds of biblical marriage. And uh, this book had a great influence on the sexual revolution uh, of the 1960s. Uh, he identified the oppressed class as minorities, women, and homosexuals. So if you're, if you're a male, heterosexual, um, Christian, and you're Caucasian, you're 0 for 4. You're toast. Um, you're, you're an oppressor big time. Um, but this, is, this view led to many of the protests of the 1960s, the black power movement, whereas you had Martin Luther King Jr. saying people should not be judged by the color of their skin. They should be judged by their character. Um, and, and he wanted to stand up in a nonviolent way uh, for the rights of individuals. Uh, but the movement that goes on here, the radical feminism, the black power movement, the black panther movement, the gay rights movement, uh, the, the whole sexual liberation movement, a lot of that was influenced by Marcuse. Uh, he defined liberating tolerance as tolerance of any views from the extreme left, in other words, cultural Marxist or neo-Marxist, but the rejection of any traditional views. So this is, this is his liberating tolerance or new tolerance is political correctness. It's you're only tolerant of those who agree with you. Everybody else, you're not supposed to be tolerant of them, okay? So you get a, two people get interviewed on a talk show, somebody who's standing up for traditional values, somebody who's totally opposed to it, a Marxist. The Marxist can scream at that person and call them names, and that, that's the new tolerance, okay? Um, Saul Alinsky realized... Okay, we're getting all this philosophical thought, but we got to bring it to the streets. And so he was a cultural Marxist, and uh, he was a devoted disciple of cultural Marxism. He wrote his book, Rules 
uh, for radicals. It was a practical guide for community organizers to promote his views. He had influenced the thought of many politicians. Um, um, former President Barack Obama was a community organizer who was a disciple of Saul Alinsky. Uh, Hillary Clinton wrote her bachelor's thesis on Saul Alinsky's uh, Rules for Radicals. And by the way, she didn't disagree with his views either. The only known picture of Barack Obama actually uh, as a professor lecturing, he's drawing a diagram on the, on the, the, the whiteboard that's one of Saul Alinsky's uh, 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 diagrams. So, uh, so he's basically, so it's kind of like, forget about just the philosophy professors um, and the science professors. We got to in influence, we got to come up with a team of ground warriors, community organizers that stir up riots and things of that sort. And, um, and that's influenced many politicians today. Uh, you can still get the rules for radicals. It's still in print if you want to see what the other side is saying. So cultural Marxism has a hatred uh, for traditional Christian values. It's a divide and conquer strategy. It produces tribalism, gets us to divide into different tribes against each other, attacks the family unit, and it's an attempt to overthrow society through their views. Uh, people are not judged by their individual character which is the way we've traditionally in, the, in Western civilization have, have uh, been taught to, uh, to judge people by their character, not by what group they're placed in, but the cultural Marxist wants them to be judged by the group they are in. And so you're either an oppressor or the oppressed, and uh, critical race theory is just uh, one aspect of this um, where it, it, the minorities are automatically oppressed I mean, okay, Oprah Winfrey and LeBron James, they are oppressed, according to these guys. And I wish they would share some of their oppression with me. I could use some of those billions of dollars, okay? So, you know, a, a poor European male or female who lives in Appalachia in a beat-up trailer and... It doesn't know where their next meal is coming from. That's an oppressor. But billionaire people, if someone's a, a, a homosexual, um, they could be a billionaire. They're oppressed. Okay? So the facts don't really matter. Again, they care about their community's truth, not the facts. And so people get judged by the community that they're in. So three white guys wearing ball caps, minding their own business, they get pepper sprayed because they're automatically oppressed. And then the people that pepper sprayed them didn't even know who they were, knew nothing about them. So you're either oppressors or oppressed, and the individual dies. So critical race theory, um, the oppressors versus the oppressed. If you're a European-American who has assimilated with Western civilization, you're automatically an oppressor. It doesn't matter if you never had a racist thought, or said a racist word, committed a racist act, you're automatically a racist. And if you're a billionaire minority, you're oppressed. Or a billionaire homosexual, you're oppressed. Um, or a, a billionaire female who's on the radical woman's lib side, you're oppressed, okay? And uh, this is systemic racism, okay? So um, the, it's like the whole, if the whole system is racist, what has to be replaced? The whole system. What's the whole system? It's called the United States government, American sovereignty, the Constitution of the United States. That's what they want replaced. Um, then intersectionality, because I'm 0 for 4, I'm considered white. My buddies I didn't consider me white when I was growing up. I got in a lot of fights with guys who didn't think I was white. And, um, but I'm supposed to be white, male, I am male, um, Christian, I am Christian, and heterosexual, I am heterosexual. So I'm, I'm 0 for 4. So that makes, that intersects. 
So I'm an oppressor four times over. But if somebody is a female, homosexual, non-Christian minority, they have a lot of power. They walk into a room, they might have more power than anybody else in the room because of their intersectionality. So you see, like she, uh, you dub Robin D'Angelo um, uh, used to teach there. Now she travels around. And by the way, they're, they're, they're talking about oppression and this and that and blah, blah, blah. It's like, lady, why should we listen to you? According to your own definition, you're a racist. You realize that these, uh, the leading critical race theorists are making between $30,000 and $60,000 a talk. Chris is a good guy. He doesn't pay me that much. Okay? When he speaks for me, I don't write him a check for thirty grand, And we're oppressors, okay, having a hard time paying our mortgage, um, and, um, and supposedly these critical race theorists are standing up for the oppressed. You want to see what this stuff is about, just read her book, White Fragility. I mean, in training, she spells it out, in training when they're telling you because you're white, you're a racist, if you get upset, that proves you're a racist. If you decide to keep your mouth shut, that proves you're a racist. If you start crying, that proves you're a racist. If you say, but I have minority friends, that proves you're a racist. It doesn't matter what you do. If you breathe, that proves you're a racist. So, I mean, it's just like you stack the deck that way. There's no way to refute that. But again, you know, if I told her there's no rational defense of your views, she would probably say thank you because it's just a narrative. It's just a postmodern narrative. She embraces that through her will and her will to power. Ibram uh, X. Kendi, um, how to be an anti-racist? No, he, what he calls an anti-racist is traditionally a racist. Um, but uh, again, these people, by the way, these people are making a lot of money um, gi giving talks about this stuff. So you've got critical race there. You have the oppressors versus the oppressed. Uh, the oppressors, white, male, heterosexual, Christian. The oppressed, non-white, female, um, homosexual and transgender, non-Christian. So basically they want to destroy Western civilization so they want to destroy America, which is greatly influenced by Western civilization. And then they reject this new religion, this hybrid, that's pulling together all these different facets. They reject uh, the biblical God. Uh, the new American religion rejects the biblical God, promotes either atheism or neo-paganism, a newer form of paganism, and environmental extremism, Okay. It's more of a new age belief system. Man is free to recreate himself. Um, transgenderism. If you don't, uh, homosexuality. If, you, if God created you to be a male and you don't like it, we don't believe in God anymore. You're free to recreate yourself, to be whatever it is you want to be. Um, globalism and the deification of the state. Uh, the new religion rejects patriotism. It promotes globalism, a one-world government, and opposes the United States sovereignty. It promotes total trust in the government. Now, I don't know where you stand on what they call a vaccine. I, think, I know it's an injection. I'm not, I'm not convinced it's a vaccine. Synthetic RNA, we've never tested that on humans. It's being tested right now. I don't care where you stand on it. If you've researched it and you think you should get the injection, more power to you. If you've researched it and you think you shouldn't, more power to you. I don't think uh, the government, I don't think we should have total trust in the government. Right. And that's, that's not just individual humans, that's even businesses. I don't think businesses should say, well, Dr. Fauci wouldn't lie to us. Um, uh, we're just going to trust the government. Look, you, you, total trust is something you give to God. Okay. We're not even supposed to trust our own wisdom. We're supposed to trust in God and his word. So they're, they're treating the government like it's God. They want us to have total trust in the government. In the end, the new religion is worship of the state. Um, 
total, total government control of health care. Once the government started taking over health care, you, you find that all of a sudden, you know, you have a life-threatening ailment, and they schedule you for two months out. Because your health, your health care costs keep rising. Mine have gone up threefold since Obamacare. It just gradually went up higher and higher because we're paying for others. People who illegally come into the country. Somebody's got to pay for them. And, um, uh, but once the government takes control of health care, there are going to be death panels. You know? I would not be surprised if the eighth or ninth injection you got to get I would not be surprised if, they, if they're trying to replace the human immune system. I'd rather trust my God-given immune system, to be honest with you. And, uh, but I wouldn't be surprised if eventually it's like, okay, a new virus came out. Did it accidentally come out, or was it planned? A new virus just came out, and you need the eighth injection. However, we've looked at your social credit score, and you don't qualify for it. I don't, I'm going to tell you, I don't want to be dependent upon Bill Gates for my immune system, okay? And, um, but they want total control of health care, arbitrary laws, education becomes indoctrination. C.S. Lewis predicted that in the 1940s. When, when the government rejects right and wrong, it makes arbitrary laws that always protect those in power and enslaves the masses. And education becomes indoctrination and political correctness because you're trying to train little children to grow up and be subservient, to grow up to be slaves to an all-powerful state, to worship the state. And then the extreme environmentalism, um, you know, Al Gore, John Kerry, they want to fly around in their private jets and they want to get us out of automobiles. And they don't even consider themselves hypocrites because they think, look, we know what's best for you. We know better. Uh, we know what's best for you. You don't. We'll take care of you, but you got to get out of your vehicles. Bill Gates wants us to start eating synthetic meat. He says eventually we'll get used to the taste. Excuse me, Bill, if I ate at your house, I'm sure there'd be steak, okay? And um, nobody's going to make me eat fake, fake meat. I'm fed up with fake news. Now you want to give me fake meat? Um, but, uh, but whatever the case, um, Klaus Schwab of the World Economic Forum, working in cahoots with the United Nations um, and the World Health Organization as well, he wants a global reset of the world's economy due to COVID-19. Global reset. You know what global reset there means? Redistribution of the world's wealth. Where's most of that wealth? It's in the American middle class. So it sounds real nice, but it's not we want to feed the poor. What it is, is we want to make the American middle class like the poor so they won't object when we merge America with a global state. Okay? Bill Gates even went and got U.S. patent number 060606, I'm not lying, um, just look it, look it up, um, where it gives him the ability to track every human being on the planet um, through, uh, what is it, nanoparticles, and, and uh, luciferase, now we, we've used luciferase on some cancer patients, um, luciferase is it, kind of the stuff in lightning bugs, okay? But we could get this to the point where we can identify just with a, a, a special app on a, on a smartphone, you can go over somebody's wrist and tell it will, it will light up if they've been vaccinated or not. The good thing is they did not get this in the so-called vaccine. A higher up from, from Pfizer, who was also medically trained and a lawyer who left, did not like what was going on. She said the good news is they, it was a race to get the, the vaccine, so they didn't get everything that they wanted. So I don't think they got, they didn't get the luciferase, they didn't get the tracking mechanism, um, but it, it's like Elon Musk. You know, I, he said the synthetic RNA, he said, look, these guys can extend your life expectancy by 10 years 
or they can take away your 10 years from your life expectancy. What they do with it is, is, their, is their business. And what he's basically saying is don't trust these guys. By the way, the guys that are behind a lot of this technology are like Bill Gates. They're population control fanatics. They think we've got to get rid of most human beings on the planet Earth. Um, Bill Gates has gone on record publicly saying he thinks the best way to lower the world's population uh, is through vaccines. Um, um, but whatever the case, they would love to track all human beings on the planet Earth. And, um, and so what you have is the state becomes God. Now keep in mind, when we say the state, it's no longer just the government. Just as um, George Orwell said in the 1940s, the state has now become not only government bureaucrats, but the media, the schools, billionaire business executives, um, technology geniuses and gurus, uh, and compromised military leaders. They're all working together. It's like a, they've got their own big uh, satanic coven, if you will. I don't even know if that's an exaggeration, to be honest with you. Um, now, the Christian view of the individual, we're all created in God's image, so human life is sacred. We're not just important collectively, we're important as individuals, okay? So true community is found in the church, the body of Christ, where we were created in God's image, and though fallen, the Lord Jesus died on the cross for our sins. If we trust in him for salvation, we become part of the body of Christ. That's true community where the worth of each individual is acknowledged. Um, with the uh, cultural Marxism and this new religion, these godless systems like postmodernism, Marxist communism, cultural Marxism, national socialism, and, and fascism can never produce true community. They only produce collectivism. You're only important collectively. Okay? If a branch on a tree is dying, you can enhance the growth of the tree by cutting off that branch. Okay? So when they act like man is God, that means man collectively. And as C.S. Lewis said, the man molders of the new age, they're going to decide who lives and who dies, who goes to reindoctrination camps, and, uh, and who has the freedom to speak. Look at this cancel, cancel culture going on right now. You think America's free? It, it, it may, it, you know, it may, we, we think we're free because the government hasn't come after us yet. But there's a lot of people who love freedom that grew up in slave societies, and somehow the Nazis or the uh, Soviets never got around to imprisoning them. Um, but believe me, there are people behind bars right now, and people whose careers have been destroyed because they've been canceled because they had the audacity to speak up for what is true and what is good. So our, our response, we must speak the truth um, in love to a world that despises truth. Uh, we must love our enemies and pray for them, even if they persecute us. If, you, if the day comes when you got two guards leading you down a corridor to be executed for your faith, love them and speak the truth in love to them and forgive them. Um, but, and we must pray that God softens, softens their hearts. The abolition of man, uh, men without chest is going on right now. We are producing human beings that seem incapable of judging between right and wrong, truth and falsehood. It's very, very dehumanizing. And so pray that God softens their heart. This is why I think we're getting closer and closer to the second coming of the Lord Jesus. Um, because eventually it's going to get, if things just keep going the way they're going, the, the world is going to be unreachable because they've been so dehumanized. And even, I'm hoping you can reach your neighbors. I'm hoping. There are still some people that are open. And maybe there's some people who aren't open. Maybe God will open their hearts uh, through their circumstances or whatever it may be, and the Spirit of God will open their hearts. But at the very least, do not allow yourself to be conformed to the pattern of this world. Don't follow the crowd just because it's convenient. Okay? 
We must be transformed by God renewing our minds through Bible study and prayer. Okay? We got to remain true to God and proclaim God's truth in a culture of lies, in a culture um, that hates truth. All right, if you just bow your heads. Father, in Jesus' precious name, we, we love you, Lord, and we thank you so much for sending your son to die on the cross for our sins and so that if we trust in him for salvation, we are saved uh, by your grace. And uh, we just thank you for indwelling us with your Holy Spirit, for guiding us through life. We thank you for giving us your written word, the scriptures, so to give us guidance through life and the Holy Spirit to empower us to obey the scriptures uh, from the heart. We also thank you, Lord, as Americans for the prosperity that, uh, and the freedom and the good health and the food uh, and the occupations, the careers that we've had in this country growing up in a free country. And so we pray, Lord, that uh, if it be your will, that revival would come in our land. But we recognize, Lord, that without repentance, there will be no revival. And so I pray, Lord, that you would cause first the church, but then people outside the church, cause them to come to your salvation, but cause repentance, a turning away from our sin and a turning back to the God who blessed us so abundantly. And Lord, if, if it is the time for America to go the way of all other countries and empires, if it's time for America to fall, uh, many of us have proven that we can, we can serve you and your son and your spirit when days are good, but empower us by your spirit to continue to serve you when days get bad. Uh, help us to be willing to live for you when days are good so that we, be, we would be willing to die for you when days get bad. We know, Lord, we cannot survive uh, the, the, the coming trials without the indwelling Holy Spirit. So empower us, give us the full armor of God and empower us to be your people who speak the truth in love, people who love their enemies and pray for those who persecute them. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen.